Welcome back everybody. Very exciting because we finally got insulation up top. I'm Greg, of course. What's your name and what's your company? Robert Stevenson Eagle Insulation. What, what do you normally do when you're insulating people's homes? Like For me, I would definitely call this a high performance home. You okay. know, and high performance is a lot of different things. Not only efficiency, but it's design, it's function long term, it's all those things. So why? What's the difference? You, well, you, like any good building, great building, starts from the bottom. And it sounds like with your uh, potential in-floor heat and, of course, all this, all this concrete is a thermal mass. So that thermal mass not only retains energy, but it's also a thermal lag, so it lets off. It, it's a huge performance standard once sure. you throw all this foam up top. Dude, this energy ain't going anywhere. I mean, we're in here. It's, what, 28 degrees, 30 degrees outside. I'm in a T-shirt, and I feel like <laughs> it's probably 55 degrees in here. I don't know. If you look, at it's just the only heater we have. And this has only been going for a couple hours this morning. What details do people normally have in, let's say, not a high performance home? We won't call them low performance. We'll just say the average install doesn't have under decking spray foam on it. What do they usually have? I would say probably 40% of the new homes being built right now that I deal with yeah. are, are spraying their roof line, just like you did. And the, you know, when we do a loose fill on the back side, <sighs> It's so common because it's it's a inexpensive product and they can save their budget for all the finished stuff, which is a great way to go about it. But I'm all about function. I'm all about long-term performance. It's so hard to upgrade your insulation without a huge cost increase compared to like chain swapping out your cabinets. There's no comparison when you go into a rebuilt home or built home and then we got to go in and do re a retrofit of sorts with right. insulation. It's priced. Climbing it's around, expensive. climbing around the attic and stuff. Climbing around, not being <clears throat> intrusive in people's homes, busting drywall, you name it, busting old water lines, condensation lines, been there, done that. <laughs> For me, this is the only way to do it. Like. This will make your 2,400 square foot home affordable to live in and comfortable. Y'all guys can be in here comfortably yeah. and affordably. And when the hard times, if they ever hit, hopefully they don't, you can able to still be comfortable, not cranking things down. And you have just a beautiful home that you're not worried about how you're gonna heat and cool in it during the rough times. You've got it made, you've done pay for it. There's a lot of builders who watch our channel. And you mentioned something about how to build in a way that would make your job either easier or the install more uniform. Can you run through that with us real quick? Yeah, this is a big deal for, you know, the insulators like to feel important too. <laughs> That's for sure. So <clears throat> when we come into a job site, plumbers, electricians, you want a scared electrician, throw a broom at him. He's yeah. gonna run off, you know? <laughs> so anyway, we come into job sites and this is 85, 90% of them. And we were picking up after all the, the main trades, the plumbers, electrical, electricians, HVAC. In winter time, there's a ton of mud. And for us to come in and cover the floors, we got to mask everything off head to toe. So for us to have a clean job site when we walk in is absolutely amazing. It sets us up for success to do a great job. Otherwise, we're sitting here scrambling, cleaning things up, and we're spending time on something that I feel that we shouldn't. And when we leave, we want to leave it how we found it. Electrical lines and access. Man, generally <clears throat> these guys are really clean, just like these. They're all nice and tight together. Yeah. Near a post upright, and boom, I got all this access to lay down uh, foam insulation without obstacles. And without the obstacles, it just ensures a better chance of uh, uniformity and also just great coverage no no funky voids behind it because you can if you're not spraying correctly if you're praying and spraying they call it you can like make a wave and like roll the foam over and there'll be these pockets I of see. voids yeah, in there yeah. so so obstacles helps ensure success we have a couple of wires here I don't mean to pick on the electrician this is really not that bad but I've seen some really tough spots where they just not run on 90s and near our obstacles and this isn't too bad, but sometimes we'll have areas where we just really can't access. We have low, low uh, roof line access, and then we just have crud in the way. So yeah. if they could really pay attention on where they put their fasteners and up tight, it allows us to go in there and just do you know top quality work. So faster. keep it keep it tight, keep it clean. Yes, sir. And uh, one of the things that I noticed when I hired these guys to come in here, I thought I had a clean job site, and then I walk in and you guys cleaned it up. The 90% more, because it was just that much stuff was in the way. Even as clean as I thought I had it, it wasn't nearly good enough for you guys. So make sure your job sites are clean. Another thing was timing. I feel like you're being too nice when I asked you this before. I should have gotten you in here 
before the framing? Well, when, when should I have gotten you in here? Because electricity was in here and the framing was here. When should you have come? I've been a long-term carpenter, small general contractor. I, I focus on insulation, energy retention these days, sustainability. So for me, of course, I'm going to ideally, I like better coverage. And I'm getting older. I like to be comfortable when I work. So, right. for, so for me, an, an <clears throat> insulated structure while you're doing the framing or anything only adds to production because you're not cold, you're not overly hot, you're in a more comfortable environment, so you're able just to excel easier. So for me, without protrusions, assuming there's not a million protrusions in this place, mm -hmm. and right now there's not, there's one protrusion right there that's a plumbing vent that's yeah. through the roof. Other than that, this, they, I can come in here and without the plumbing, the electrical, without the frame, I could have ran a scissor lift and I would have cut my time probably in half. Man. So, but is that... That's the insulator, wanting to speed things up and do a great job. But then if y'all would have done that, like I said, everybody could have come in here and it would have been, for me, easier because I would have been more comfortable. I mean, just hands down. It wouldn't have interfered with any of the plumbing or the electrical other than maybe a couple of spots on the edges where they might would have had to scrape a small amount of foam, but nothing that a scraper or nothing that a grinder with a wire wheel or an oscillating tool can't knock out like that. All right, I think maybe the last thing that the, the viewers will want to know is, what did you do exactly? Because we, we see all this foam looking stuff and it is foam, of course. How many products did you use? How difficult is it to change between the products? So we used a, in this situation, we did a hybrid situation to keep costs down on a roof line. Hybrid being we're using two types of insulation and we have to use a vapor barrier insulation that they call for you know, almost 100% of the time. I was gonna say nine times out of 10, but generally it's all the time now. Every once in a while, you'll see where it's not and you have to still create that vapor barrier a different way. Moving on. Sure. Closed cell foam creates a vapor barrier at an inch and a half, a class two vapor barrier. But in order for our dew point to not be in an open cell foam or batting or whatever the second type of insulation, you have to do 50% R value of whatever your projected R value is. In this case, we were shooting for an R49. That's what La Plata, Plata County calls for up top. And so 50% of that would be approximately an R25. And so we did three and a half inches of closed cell foam. Okay. Why? It's R7 per inch. So that, so that way we hit our 50% and our dew point is now either within the closed cell foam or somewhere on the outside. It's nowhere in the porous insulation. Porous insulation is basically anything that is not closed cell foam. You know, well, rigid board is still a type of closed cell foam, like blue board. Understood, board, yeah. Still the same stuff. Okay, so we, after, after we did our three and a half inches of closed cell foam, um, and this is a 1.8 pound, R7 per inch, all this, all of the foam that I use is uh, stuff that's rated for Intertech Gold standards for indoor air quality, which is good in California for all your schools, daycares, office buildings. So it's the best that I can find in terms of indoor air quality and also sustainability. It's, it's, it's produced here in the States versus a lot of this stuff is not. A lot of stuff is produced in the States, but they'll use a different A side from China and they'll make their own B side where we just got to pay attention to the details and, okay. and you can really get some top, top notch. Now on top of that, really for foam on our roof line with ease, open cell was our only other option. We couldn't have really put anything else. You didn't have the depth. You didn't have like two by four or 14 inch, you know, right. uh, die joists or whatever up there. Then that we could have maybe done batting or we could have done mineral wool or we could have done a, a blowing bib on top of that or something. So you chose, you chose open, open cell. Open cell to yeah. stick directly on there. That way there's no air gap between your closed cell and your open cell or your closed cell and your, your secondary insulation. It's okay. all, it's all tight. What happens is a lot of times they'll spray less closed cell foam and then they'll put in batting and have a gap right there. And that gap is where hidden condensation happens. And over time, it takes a long time, you'll start having mold, mildew issues, material de degradation. And uh, you have people like, I just had a lady that had a mold toxicity situation and which leads to like chemical sensitivity and leads to like, a high dollar build and rebuild. Oh my gosh, that poor lady. So with our open cell, it's a R3.8 per inch. It's directly onto that closed cell foam. And I did an additional seven inches. More than likely, and I tend to overspray, and I definitely did. I used a 0.3 
extra of closed sale and about mm -hmm. a 0.2 extra of open sale on this roof line. So there's definitely probably closer to an R60, but we're calling an R49 in the low spots. Um, I'm a probably a little heavier sprayer than some of the other guys for what we, what we uh, sell, but we did seven inches on top of the uh, closed cell foam you can feel it on this cold windy day up here they're on the, like a high yeah a high heel i'll say with yeah. superb views all the way around but uh what you can't what you can't get in videos is the feeling like it just feels nice in here dude, it feels and i can't am i missing anything is there a question you wish i would have asked that i didn't ask so generally what we'll do we'll come in and we will fire foam all our protrusions right now this home doesn't have like any protrusions going on there's a couple of things and look you already filled it up yeah. i was going to tell you to <laughs> because uh air was pushing through there when i was cleaning up so that's awesome you so they, that up. these are for our um just so the viewers know these are three inch holes all the way around they are for our um mini split lines Okay. That, that's it yeah, so they're going to be set. filled eventually yeah 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 no and uh I, because everything's sealed up those little spots get magnified it's crazy because there's okay. nowhere the air to go those things become like super suckers or super blowers okay. it's amazing how much positive pressure was cranking out of that that little thing because there's nowhere else for it to go but that one spot what else could we have done or what else should get done we'll call it a super seal they've already sealed off all their windows mm -hmm. which th that gives you air barrier generally on traditional construction you'll have a, a a bottom plate and we'll either caulk i don't like to caulk we like to use seal tape but depending on people's budget we can use a long-term caulk but uh ideally we put a seal tape down and this would be an exterior wall to to make sure we get a perfect air seal. Air barrier, Air right? barrier, yeah. yeah. No air infiltration at all. And then same way with all your sister studs, you know, all your king studs, trimmers, your headers a lot of times, and this is on the exterior. Interior is not, not critical, but your exterior absolutely is. Same deal, we'll put seal tape there. Make sure all these little gaps and cracks, we might put foam, can foam in those larger gaps that we can, but uh, generally we seal all that stuff up. And then your uh, double top plate. Your double top plate, there is wherever there's wood on wood basically yeah that is where and you can see he's already sealed some of that up uh, so can i tell you the spec i have on that? i never told you that yes, sir. between each top plate i have seal gasket seal seal with yep yeah. with some pretty expensive caulking material on the wood on the bottom and on the top of the seal gasket and that's all sandwiched in there then i came back and sealed it with more caulk Big stretch. You know, if you are for sure that that air seal is perfect, my deal is I can't rely on the other guys. Understood. My, my deal is I have to make sure it's perfect. And what do I do? I make sure every single top plate, every anything that's sistered together, potential spot for air infiltration. This the it just in between the two. Again, if that cool. was an exterior wall. If yeah. it was an exterior wall, I was noticing right beneath your drywall backing. Okay. I saw daylight. Bet you it's that one on one of these. See oh. how there's a little gap right there? Yep, yep, yep. For some reason, I saw daylight in one of those, and that was after I foamed. So the, the foam was all around it, but the wood, the carpentry was so doggone good and tight that I couldn't get a perfect air seal. So what am I saying? Back off that. Leave me a little space. We can get foam behind there to make sure we have a really good air seal. Leave your room everywhere we can. Man, I really appreciate you coming out here, Robert. I appreciate your time for the video too, by the way. But let me just uh, recap real quick. Under the concrete, as you guys have been watching the series, there is foam. So there's a foam bed under this concrete. That foam comes all the way to the edge and it butts up against my wall, which is foam. This foam comes all the way up and we will continue. We'll put a little strip of foam facing these top plates that will bump into the foam on the roof. So essentially what we're going to have is an entire envelope from underfoot to the peak of the roof that is one constant insulated barrier, which I think is a pretty cool detail. What I appreciated about you is when we met, I think we stood out there for like an hour and a half just talking about building science, which was really fun. So we have more projects to do in the future and uh, appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you in the next video. All right.